Greetings, Nick with Sweetwater here, and today I'm with my good friend James Santiago, and this is What's on Your Pedal Board? Bruce Wayne had the Bat Cave, James has what I call the Tone Cave, this <laughs> beautiful thing. It's a hidden enclave within the wondrous world of Sound City Studios, that famous place where Fleetwood Mac, Nirvana, Rage Against the Machine, anybody, everybody worth their salt recorded here, from Tom Petty through Metallica, all the greats. And as I'm sure you know, James is UA's mastermind behind many of the UA effects. So he has a pedal board. He's just come out with a new pedal called the UA 68 Super Lead Amp. No guesses as to what that is. No surprises there. But yeah. that was a remarkable clean sound. That's coming from that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we think of Marshall's as like the best rock lead sound ever. But there's a whole period of guitar sounds where Marshall's clean. And if I think back to some of my early influences, like when I heard the police records, I looked on stage and there was two half stacks in yeah. there. That that thing was, that was a Marshall big British clean sound. Yeah, thanks for saying that, because a lot of people don't realize, yeah, those classic clean police sounds were yeah. actually Marshalls. Marshalls. And then I saw also with another guy, um, uh, The Fix, Jimmy right. West Orham, one of the most super stingy, rhythmy, clean, all Marshalls. In fact, I think he had two of Jubilees by the end there too. Right. Again, Marshalls, not not this typical Fender thing. Um, although, if we historically, we think of the Marshall growing up out of the basement era, but it went its own way. So, if you get a good Marshall, it has a great hidden clean sound, and and that's kind of what I use as my own favorite platform is actually a very act Marshall. So it kind of caves in and kind of gets a little spongy on the clean, and if I roll the volume up, it kind of gets a little distorted. So that was the very act amp model. In yeah, there. I'm using, which is like the number one rule for getting the classic brown lead sound. I'm just turning the amp to five. Right. And then using, it. in this case, I was using some V30 speakers. Right. And if I roll my guitar down, like even on the neck pickup, you know. bridge, I put it on that, and I take all this stuff off of here. There's, there's all those clean sounds are in there. You could do a country record with that. Yep. It, it's in there. But if I hit it harder, you know. I am trying to get the clean also with the if i hit it just hard enough that hendrix sort of punch right that whole thing of you know and then just using my tonal controls so i think we've talked earlier about just being more old school and aware of your volume control and your tone control yeah you it, can do a lot with the guitar yeah if i play lighter and play these you know Play lighter, roll the tone down. It sounds like I went to a hollow body. What a concept. What a concept. You yeah. use the controls use on it. the guitar, kids. Don't yeah. forget that. Those yeah. controls are there not just to be turned on, turned on left like idiots like me do. Yeah. Try messing them with them. Watch the late, great Jeff Beck and yes. watch what he does with his hands all the time. Not just with his picking nuances, but he's always messing with those strat controls. Oh, man. Yeah, the, the thing of just seeing his pinky wandering over there and doing Oh, all the time, things. yeah. So, I, I, in fact, there's a few guitars I have where I've worn out these two controls from constantly doing this the whole time and flicking that around. So I sort of learned that way. So my thought of a pedal board is to never have it on at all times, but it's things that kind of push things in general directions. Right, so these are just little colors that you yeah. add to your palette. So, because you've got quite a few pedals here. Let's quickly hear one, two, three, yeah. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, plus that. So let's quickly walk through them. So, because okay. we're gonna do a detailed video on the um, 68 Super Lead amp in the shortly. So you're starting with the, this is an Arbiter England first face. Original 1966 Arbiter England germanium. That's the first few months of production. So they were all this sort of dull gray color. There's no Dallas on it. Right. It is really, really big sounding. So if I'm going to use it, I ended up using it on an amp that's cleaner. Like I was going for a clean sound here. So I'm on in the V30s for a clean. 
So when I turn this thing on, the first thing I typically do is start with the volume down and then check the rhythm sound. Like it's there. I roll my volume up. Ooh. There it is, yeah. Ooh. But I can always turn it down and then still get the. Don't let it grunge out. Gotcha. Again, I'm not doing anything with the pedals. I left the pedal on and I'm just yep. rolling my volume down. All that stuff. And I noticed you've also got this blue one. Is this for blues? Yeah. Or what it, is this for? It, good call. Well, it's funny, you know, I, I have a bunch of them. So just like we were talking about, like I have this in front of a clean amp bright because it's so dark. The darker the amp gets, the brighter the fuzz has to get for me to cut. Right. So I end up on silicon ones. So this is silicone. And that's a, and that's a germanium one. So if I if I only had an app that was going to be a dark sound, I'd probably have to use that one or a couple gotcha. other ones. Gotcha. And and that's the the big problem is they they don't have a tone control, and if you add one, it ruins the sound of the fuzz. Gotcha. No, I hear you. So that's my excuse for buying a hundred fuzzes and and thanking George Church for me stalking him and having him make me fuzzes every other week. <laughs> Sorry. Talking of distortion adding yeah. devices, so then we move, talking of George Trips as well, so we go to the way huge yeah. overrated special. What I mean, I guess you have to have a Tube Screamer-esque pedal Is for a Marshall. Yeah, uh, and, and my feeling is like, if you can't put a Tube Screamer and it doesn't work in front of your amp, maybe your amp's not doing the right thing. Right. Because uh, one of the cool things about it is you can get that sort of, not really scoop V, but a little bit of a punchier, bright and, and low end rhythm or lead sound, and then use that Tube Screamer to pop that middle back open give you a little boost and let you cut through a band. Right. And that's exactly what I use this for, which is this is a, uh, a Bonamassa version of a, a Tube Screamer. I know everyone thinks it's the D word. Right. But I think that's just a, a funny joke he had. Yeah, no, I hear you. So if I turn that on, I'll, I'll, I'll just show you what it is. Um, in fact, I'm gonna do one thing is switch to, I'm weird about that, switch to a 68 basket weave Marshall. Okay. So just so from rhythm. <laughs> Basic, in fact, I'll turn it off. There's the basic sound. So if we turn this on, there's the open mid range. Yeah, though it immediately cuts through. Yeah. That's the thing, and it works great. Kind of can't go wrong. The one thing I am careful about is to not place this anywhere after these two guys. Right. Because I, I don't want any buffers. Gotcha. Yeah, so it's always cable, fuzz first. Or uh, another one I used to use was a uh, color sound overdriver like Beck did. Oh, that's a great pedal. Oh, so great. Except I, can't, I have to make sure it's at the front. So if I had a wah, be wah, fuzz, then I hit this. And then I, I purposely leave, actually, there's a buffer on here too. So these two are buffered, which gives me a good you know, way to drive the rest of the pedal. So. Gotcha. And talking of the next pedal, so this is an Ibanez. It's greenish, but it's, it's not a tube screen. It's, it's not Kermit green. It's a different green. Yeah, yeah it's like a lime green. And in working on the Marshalls again, I went back to some of the pedals I used to use with that, that head back there. Right. Which was, I always had a two screamer, but then in a pawn shop in San Jose, I'm like, what's up with that two screamer? It was kind of cheap, it was like 25 bucks. They're like, it's not a tube screamer. It's a Sonic Distortion. Sonic Distortion. Yeah. SD9. SD9, yes. You rarely see those. Dude, you don't. And, and I think people have sort of trying to bring them back, but I remember getting this thing home because it was so cheap, and then realizing like, it's like the smoothest, it's almost like a tube driver in a way. It's got more lows than more the lows, tube. More lows, yeah, and the, high, the highs are smooth. And if you dig into the schematic, um, this has a passive tone control. So when you, when you roll the, the tone control down, it just gets big and warm. Gotcha. So I would typically, and I'm not saying I can play like this, but I use this to push this into almost like I had a humbucker. It kind of makes the Strat sound smoother is what I want is my guitar sound to be somewhere between early Jeff Beck meets Hallsworth meets EJ, something that has a note and a bloom to it. That would be the perfect trifecta, actually. Right? With Alan in the middle, may he oh. rest in peace. Ooh. Oh my God, yeah. It just And of course, now that I've set myself up for failure by saying <laughs> all of that. Of course you have. You know, it's, it's not gonna sound like that, but that's what I, in my head, what I'm trying to do is right. hit a note, not have it go ding, pfft. I want to hit the note, and I want it to uh, kind of go open. Yeah, bloom, like you said, bloom like, like that, a flower. You, you read interviews with Alan, he talks about going through amps and trying to get them to vowel open. Yeah, because he always wanted to sound like a sax player. Yeah, he wanted to sound like a sax player. Wah! Yeah. 
And it, it's, it's a never ending battle to do that. So again, failure being, I'm gonna turn it on, it's not gonna sound like that. But that was my intent. Without it, oh, with you do it. That low end immediately gets bigger. Bigger, it's just, so it's making my plinky strat kind of flatten out and feel like it's got some girth to it. So if I, if I'm careful about not hitting the strings too hard, I can get a little bit of that. Did it there. And it's singing a little bit. And if you put a little reverb on it, you get a little bit more of that. I'm trying to get it to where you just notes kind of hang there and open. And if I turn off the reverb, getting the, uh, you know. Like, I love the Jeff Beck group, that first record. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I want it to sound like that, uh, yep. that big thing. And that's what my brain thinks is not what comes out, but right. that's sort of the intent. So you could use a tube driver, you could use the sonic distortion, things that kind of on purpose darken. I also have another trick I do on top of that, which is in here there's an Echoplex pre. Right. I, and it's back there. I used to take an Echoplex and stuff it in a loop so this would kick on with the Echoplex. Oh, killer. So if I do that on top of that, it gets way bigger and you put the verb on, then it is that sound. Yeah. yeah. And, and if I watch my picking, uh, it gets a little more of that violin sound. Cool. Talking of distortion pedals, mm -hmm. next up we have this bad boy. I haven't seen one of these in a long time. Yeah, we, uh, you know what, I, I like them. This is sort of the clon thing. Right. And you know, you're, you're opening up a can of where people start fighting about the prices of clons and the gold yep. and the silver horsies. So I bought this one because it was cheap and it was a, sort of his reissue of it. And then these things started getting expensive, which right. is ridiculous. Okay, folks, with the aid of my dollar store glasses, no expense spared here at Sweetwater, here's what the pedal says, and it's brilliant. It really made me laugh. It says this, kindly remember the ridiculous hype that offends so many is not of my making. And let's hear what the uh, hype that offends so many is. <laughs> Now, it doesn't sound like it's doing much, but it's giving me sort of that rootsy, rocky kind of sound with a little jangle to it. Because like it. without it, I can still roll my volume down. So it's not the openness of this, it's not the smoothness of this, of this the smooth thing that kind of takes over. This is sort of right in between these two. Gotcha. And there are a lot of people that make these sort of circuits. Yep. So. And they're uh, not offensive at all. Well, that doesn't no, offend me. It makes me smile. So. Yeah, and I, I thought it was funny. So this is the one I ended up throwing on my board if I need that. The one thing I, I will say is uh, if you know about the, the circuit is a lot of people use it as a boost. Right. As a clean boost. And if you look at it, there's actually a dual pot in there. So the more you get it distorted, there is actually a clean sound in there. Right. So it's so a dual thing. Yeah, dual kind of tube screamery esque Esque, but yeah. also a jangly thing. So right. I run the distortion kind of in the middle, so it's distorting, but my uh, clean's in there a little bit. Yeah, so when, when I said tube screamer, I mean a lot of people forget that the tube screamer yeah. has some it, clean signal clean going through it at all times. At so, all times, right, you can't get rid of it. Yeah. So this is almost an exaggeration of, of that without the mid-range thing. And then next up we have the way huge blue hippo. Yes, yeah, so I, I used to like carrying around a Leslie cabinet. I know. Why? Because, uh, you know, I started hearing all these great guitar sounds through Leslie's. And you hear, like, there's, there's Beatles records where, you know, there's a lot of Leslie on them. And I had found one used at a pawn shop. So I gutted the amp, put a Fender amp on top of that little Bandmaster. Right. And I ran my guitar into it. So I always got used to being able to have this sort of full... Le I wanted to be a, a Leslie, like a b3 player with the feet yeah yeah john lord yeah, yeah. the whole just rock organ because like organ is like the best rock guitar you've ever heard of done right deep purple's living deep purple. breathing proof of that uh, in the yeah. black and white era amazing yeah john lord's like the best rock guitar player on a keyboard on a ever. keyboard so i got used to having this sort of circular thing and wanting to get into chords that were a little bit more into that sort of jazzy r b uh sort of b3 thing so i usually set it up for kind of that uh <laughs> So 
if I was comping behind somebody, I would like roll the volume down. <laughs> So I'm not just getting in somebody's way of playing a guitar solo, I can just pretend I'm another instrument. Gotcha, what a concept. Yeah. And then next, I believe you come all the way over to this. Yeah, so that's the odd thing is, yeah, I, I break up between here, and I love Univibes, and there is a real one back there. Yeah, I saw that earlier, yeah. yeah. I love that thing, and it, uh, but again, it's one of those things where you gotta dedicate yourself to having the pedal, getting the big unit on there, and there is Velcro on it. I did have it jammed on a pedal board for a few years. Right. Which is ridiculous now. Um, so imagine this, the Univire, I have the uh, Tycho Bray Octavia too. And right. I sort of realized like, man, if I lose this stuff, I can't afford to buy it again. Right. Um, so my friend Dustin Sears made this and he's been a big Univibe guy for years and searching out all the secret bulbs. And so he, he just made the coolest, deepest one. And the cool thing is he's got this thing on the side so I can still use my foot gotcha. to get a speed. So when I turn that thing on, and this, by the way, folks, oh. is called the Sir Henry, Sir Henry by Tinsley Audio, and you yep. say he's a famous guitar tech. Yeah, yeah. Dustin has been with Eric Johnson for a couple of decades. I've he heard of that guy. Yeah, works with Kenny Wayne Shepherd. Yep. A lot of really great players, so a lot of tone freaks. Yeah. But he's been on this Univibe mission, so I, I love this thing, and he, he gets it to get that, um, when you go faster, it gets really choppy. I like it in a slow speed, so when you get that sort of... There's that chewiness to it. Yeah. And uh, my test riff is usually this uh, Hendrix tune. I just love that sound. I could live on that, and it's it's got a faster speed set on the uh, preset. Kind of can't go wrong with that. No, if you know some expensive chords like this guy does, you're in like Flint. Just yeah. get a Sir Henry. And you know what's funny is that they're all things you steal from Hendrix because he, he would use his thumb for... Even that, like, and the other one. All Hendrix stuff. I don't know where he got any of this. Probably Curtis Mayfield plus whatever his own genius was. Yeah, yeah, and he definitely had a lot of that. Oh, my God, yeah. And then we come back to the main board and of course, uh, one of your pedals, the Orion. Yeah. It's a pretty darn fine pedal. It's it's it's, uh, it's modeled after one of the units back there. I have a couple of them, and that one is a sort of new old stock EP3. Right, so Echo Plex. Yep, yep, and uh, that one came from a jazz trumpeter. Who, <laughs> come I, on. This is, this is, you know, we talk about you chasing down gear, and, you know, I, I had a beat-up <laughs> one that gone down staircases, been, been beer spilled on it, and I get a call from a friend going, hey, man, I'm on this gig, and this guy says he's got some tape echo. My friend Terry's on a jazz gig. Trumpet guy, I'm like, echo, what are you talking about? He's like, well, he, he won't show it to me, but he says if you give him like 300 bucks, he'll just send it to you. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm going to gamble. He said, not make this up. Yeah, he, I, I'm going to gamble. So I said, fine, if you don't mind, give him the money. I'll put the money immediately in the mail to you. Month goes by. And what shows up is a pristine, in the box, the cabling, the everything, mint Echo Plex. My wow. favorite Echo. Wow. Complete gamble. Well, sometimes trumpet players pay off. Well, Clyde McCoy, you know, yeah, it does pay off. Yeah, then, then I found out, I asked him a little more, and he said uh, it was based on the Bitches Brew era where Miles was using effects. Oh, okay. So he that bought in sense. the early 70s. Yeah, he, he thought he was going to be Miles and with this big bitchin' band and do that stuff. And I guess he used it for a few gigs and then never used it again. Right. And on there is still a piece of tape that has his horn settings. <laughs> the only thing on it was one little piece of tape and his address inside the cover. Oh, that's too funny. Yeah. And of course, next we come to the UA pedal, which we'll be doing a video on very shortly, right. so we're not going to labor on that. But afterwards, you have two more, another, two more UA things. So you've got the Starlight and the Golden. Yeah. Um, I think when I got used to using Marshall's, realizing there's some things that sound good in front of the amp, like a little tape echo, some wobbly modulation, but then other things that, if I can put plate reverb on or like a lexicon. After the fact, after yeah. After the fact, because you look at any of these great recordings, you know, putting putting a lexicon through a Marshall, you know, I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but it, you don't get the full effect of it. Yeah. So I can get more of like a my studio kind of process recording sound by using this on the back end. So I leave, all of this is mono. Right until I leave here, I go stereo in here. So the first thing it hits for me is uh, two Bucker Brigade Memory Man style. Sounds. Oh, nice. And so they're offset and also have the modulation. 
So when I hit a chord. Oh yeah, beautiful. And in stereo, if I hit a. Oh yeah, you, you hear the wash. It. Yeah, I live with it, it's okay. They're so dark that they don't actually get in my way. Right. It almost sounds like washy reverb. Right, gotcha. So if you take that and put it into a uh, 224. Golden, you can, yeah. Yeah, that. And if you wonder why I don't have a guitar on, you've just heard the reason why I'm not playing next to this guy. I just I cleared the room with that, by the way. That's how you clear a room. Yeah. And talking <laughs> of guitars, this is a beauty. Tell me a little bit about this Strat, because that's a <laughs> wonderful instrument. Yeah, this, this is an odd one. I always wanted a Sumber Strat. And, you know, you buy gear, you save your money, and, and then you go to these stores where you play a bunch of them. I hated every one I played. All the necks were either too small, too big, they didn't play great. Um, and then one day I get a call from a uh, friend, Josh Smith, great guitar player. Right. That's why I don't play guitar when he's in the room. Gotcha, gotcha. We, we, we will both go to lunch when he comes over. Um, he goes, like, dude, there's a Strat here. I think that's the one you've been looking for. And I get over to Norman Dreyer Guitars. Oh, you got it from Norm's. Norm, oh. which is unfortunately like seven minutes from my house. That's, uh, so your bank account hurts. <laughs> yeah, so I yeah. immediately go over there. And your wife hates you. Oh, yeah. and, and, they're, they're, and that's going to get, that's part of the story too, funny enough, is, you know, I get there, I just pick it up, and the, the minute my hand hit the neck, I'm like, oh, It's yours, it DNA is. meshed yeah, together. It was right, I felt it, and then I was like, oh crap, I, I got to have this. So I, I went back and got some stuff to trade. Right. Uh, one being a guitar that's now really uh, a cool guitar to have, thanks to Dave Grohl, but I had an original Trini Lopez. Really? Yeah, 68 Trini in red. Right. With the cool headstock and the six in a row things. And I'm thinking, you got to go. Sorry. So I, I threw that at Norm, and then whatever else I could you know, scrounge out of what was supposed to be for my new roof. Right. So that was the next phone call was to my wife, going, look, there's this guitar. Trust me, it's the one. Finally. And I'd been, I'd been to every vintage store in the world for decades. You just, you just put your hand like, nope, nope, nope. Yep, got to have it. Got to have it. And this thing was beater. It, it was not in the greatest condition. Funny, it looks like it's great now. But, you know, at the time, somebody had um, taken this to San Francisco probably in the 70s, you know, back when the Grateful Dead were modifying guitars. Right. So somebody had cleaned up the pickguard. Right. And then had spray painted the inside with like that um, black paint that's supposed to shield it. So all somebody did was just shield the better... Right. With better parts inside, which again makes it not stock anymore. Yep. So Norm's like, well, if you don't care about somebody, you know, in 1978 had, you know, shielded it and did all, I'm like, I don't care. You don't see it. And it was stage ready. Right. Perfect. So it was perfect for me. And then the weird thing was uh, I had seen some friends from Fender come over. They pick up the neck and he immediately goes, dude, you know what this is, right? I'm like, no, but it's a neck shape that's, it's a soft, big V. Right. Because usually you get the 57, they're sharp, small, yep. and edgy on the corners. This is rounded over. You can put your thumb on it. He goes, you have a 1056. I said, you sure? He's like, yeah. I popped off the neck. 10 slash 56. It's the supposed month that they started experimenting with the V shape on top of a big rounded neck. So that's a, that's a collectible piece then. I, I guess so because it's, you know, when you when you pick it up, and it's just like it wants to be played and you want to do Hendrix stuff because it feels good right. throwing yeah, your thumb yeah, over it. Yeah, you're not cutting your thumb open. Yeah, so that was the only thing I was really looking for. And it came on sort of, a, at the time, a not, you know, mint guitar. And talking of great strats, I was looking through your collection. You had another one that I'm going to bother you, please. Tell us the yeah. story. Yeah, I'm going to hand you this one. And then this involves another friend. Of course it does. Um, Norm likes to buy, like, lockers full of stuff from guys. Right. And he had bought a stuff from some guy in Texas, a tinkerer. And he's like, well, come over. There's a bunch of really beat up strats, really messed up. The yellowing is so great. That's what I thought. And he had set this one aside for himself 
And I had seen that there, there was like 54 strats that were stripped. This guy was a real bad thing. He had cut humbuckers into some of the pit guards. He was one of Eddie. Yeah, he totally was going down that rabbit hole. And then I played a bunch, and then I played this one, and it had the biggest lead sound I'd ever heard. And I didn't know why, and then another friend, Blue Saracino, who we're gonna see later today, he played it. Yeah, he can he, play. He can play. He gives the guitar back to me. He's like, you play it again? He listens, he's like, he said, there's something up with that guitar. It just sounds huge. It's huge sounding. He said, you gotta buy that. Of course, I have to buy it. Of course, yeah, you, yeah. yeah. So you called your wife again. I yeah. called my wife again. This that one was not- shed you're having, sorry, yeah. Oh no, no, it was coming again. But again, the funny thing with this is, it was gonna be expensive until I was like, well, he had not gone through the guitar yet. So here's the secret. He's like, well, we didn't really just need to see what it is. He pulls the pick art off, and he notices a cut for a humbucker in the wood. Oh. So right there, Norm's like, ah, oh, can't sell his mint. So at some point, the guy, again, and you see, it's got green paint in there. He had jabbed the humbucker yeah. in there. Yeah. Again, one to be Eddie probably. And it was not, wasn't even straight, it was turned this way. So there's this big cut here, but at some point, you could tell he was putting different pickups in. Right. So this one actually has the right air pickup put back in it. This one is the wrong ear. Because when I went to the two and fours, it was out of phase. Gotcha. It was all broken in the middle. Gotcha. So Norm's like, oh, he changed the pick. So, he, so the price is just going down and down and down and down. And I'm thinking, I might be able to afford this. And then as I'm thinking, this thing sounds great. And then I realized what he was trying to do later on. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. So I get it home and I realize he was trying to, if you look at the fender logs, or, and maybe some people know this, uh, they changed the polarity. So the 50s pickups are one polarity. Sometime in the 60s, they somehow went the other direction. So you can stitch together a hum canceling set of vintage pickups if you mix 50s with 60s or 60s with 50s, but you have to turn the white lead to the black lead. You have to revert. The guy didn't know that. Wow. He wired it that way, hearing it, and then it was broken, and he probably just left it. Right. Gotcha. And gotcha. the first thing I did was like, I took a soldering iron, flipped it, and like, it's a hum canceling vintage strat with a 50s pickup in the middle, two 64s on the outside. Perfect. So I'm thinking, okay, now we're doing good. Had it refretted, and then my friend George Trips comes over. I'm going to have the guitar on my lap. He's like, let me see that guitar. I'm like, yeah, it's heavy, but it sounds really big. He starts looking at the paint chips and looks at that wood. I don't know if you can see in there. That doesn't, if you look at the back of that strat, look, look at the, the coloring of the wood. Yeah, dude, that's, yeah. yeah. And he's like, dude, that's, that's mahogany. And I was just like, huh? <laughs> like, no, no, it's mahogany. So I took the, the neck off and, and sure enough, it's, I'm not saying it's Karina, because that's, I think that's kind of made up, but. Right. It's definitely mahogany, and you see Fender using mahogany on certain guitars, or maybe some student models. Right. So they had it. And f I think Leo was cheap, and you would just, well, if it's a solid color. Doesn't matter. Just paint it, doesn't matter. So this ended up, and you know, I'm gonna own Norm for this, because again, this was all just last minute stuff. After he's like, get it out of here, it's all beat up and trashed. Right. It ended up being a piece of trash, a vintage Fender that, has a really unique story to it. Because and it's yeah, rare again. It's yeah. rare again. So Oddly it's enough, it's rare again. Two rarities. Yeah, so you, anytime you see that, and, and I just love the way that this had done years and probably smoky clubs because the white is there. Yeah. And then you take the pickguard off, it is mint white under the pickguard. Oh, how weird. Anyway, to finish this off, fascinating stories, thank you. Um, could you play us out on that guitar, please? Sure. Please? And there you have it, folks. Remember three things. Number one, don't forget to use the volume and tone controls on your guitar. They work and they're very, very effective. Also, use pedals sparingly. And last but by no means least, talk your wife or your girlfriend into a guitar you like because you never know. As this man's proven, he got two bargains, two yeah. expensive bargains that are worth much, much more than he paid for. Who cares about the roof apart from your wife? That's right. So please play us out, my friend. Sure. All right.